Don't believe the hype of the negative media. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> H Y P E. Don't believe it. Hello and welcome to the Don't Believe the Hype podcast. A very wise person once said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is the intention of this podcast. Our goal is to empower you to change your mind, and in doing so, you can change your life. To do so, you must be willing to transform your life from the inside out. And that is the reason you should be tuned in to this podcast. So if you're ready to be educated, motivated, and inspired to live the life of your dreams, then sit back, relax, and take notes. Because you are about to be energized with some high-octane insights and wisdom designed specifically for you. So don't believe the hype of the mainstream media. There has never been a better time to be alive than right now. And you have everything you need inside of you to create an extraordinary life. So now it's up to you to change the way you look at things so the things you look at will change. Because when you do that, you will gain complete control over your life and nothing will be impossible for you. So let's get started with the Don't Believe the Hype podcast with your host, Coach Michael Taylor. Welcome to the Don't Believe the Hype podcast, where the intention is to empower you to transform your life from the inside out. The key to your transformation lies in your willingness to change your mind, because by changing your mind, you can change your life. So remember what the good book says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So once again, if you change your mind, you can change your life. So, are you ready? Let's go. Today, we're having a conversation about optimism, which is one of my favorite topics because I consider myself to be an irrepressible optimist with a passion for the impossible. Unfortunately, most people do not share my optimism. As a matter of fact, most people would suggest I'm an idealistic, head in the clouds, new age kook who is in denial of the challenges facing our world and who is out of touch with reality. And yet, I still hold firm to my belief that there are plenty of reasons for optimism. And as a matter of fact, I believe there's never been a better time to be alive on the planet than right now. And joining me today is someone who I believe shares my sense of optimism. His name is Jurian Camp, and he is the editor and publisher of Camp Solutions Magazine, which is dedicated to finding solutions to the challenges facing our world. I've been following his work for several years now, and his work was actually part of the inspiration for my latest book titled, Don't Believe the Hype of the Negative Media. So it is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome Jurian to the show. Hello, Jurian, how are you? I am doing well, and I'm so pleased to be with you, and thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Michael. So I'm really excited to have a fellow optimist on the show, but before we start talking about your work, Let's start off with a few icebreakers. So first of all, tell us where you're from. Well, I am from the lowlands of the Netherlands in Europe. That's where I was born and raised. And uh, it's now about 17 years ago that I came to California at the time to bring a magazine that I had launched in Dutch, in that Dutch language, in an English language to the US. And I never left. Ah, so tell us a little bit about your family, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Well, um, at the time uh, I came in, as I just said, uh, to California with four children and my then wife and my four children, of course, are still there. They're spread out over the world. And as a proud Dutch father, I always wondered uh, how many of them would ultimately partner up, if I can say it like that, with a fellow Dutch uh, national. As it turns out, I mean, they're not all, um, I guess, married, but, but 
as, as it turns out, three of them are now in, you know, in whatever, uh, different language, different nationality relationships. One of them is uh, married to someone from India, one another one to someone from Italy and a British uh, national. And so, uh, so far, only my son is with a in a relationship with somebody from the Netherlands. So there you see the international impact, which is nice and good. There you go. Uh, it's one of the things talking optimism. If I want to be optimistic about our world, I always look at the number of, of intercultural and even better interracial marriages, because if that is rising, then of course, ultimately, if we all are connected through blood, then there is no need to fight. So that would be helpful, I suppose. And that is a number that is rising all the time. So in any event, that uh, is my life, but there's also a bit of my past life because unfortunately uh, I'm no longer married to the woman uh, who is the mother of my children. But I'm very happy to be with a new love already for years, five years in Santa Barbara in California. That's where I am. So I, uh, I'm- Well, you know what they say about the second time around, right? The second no. time around. <laughs> I don't know what they say. Be Tell optimistic because the second one can be better than the first one. Well, in my case, it's definitely so. And there's, of course, that is a long personal story, which probably is not for this moment. But the one thing what I've learned is, of course, when you focus, as I've done for a long career, for, you know, some 25 years on finding the solutions for, as I always say, people and planet, the solutions for people have a lot to do with the very work you are, you know, you're focusing on how can we lead healthier, happier lives? And what can we do with our mindsets do, to do better? And today, you know, I've learned so much more because of all that work um, uh, that I now know my, I know myself much better. And also, uh, you know, I have a much better sense of what, what is good for me and what is not good for me. Today, the person I am today would have never married the very woman I was married to for a long time. And that is not because she is you know, the wrong person, but she is maybe the wrong person for me, which is something I now know, but of course I didn't. And that's, that's the beauty of growth and learning lessons, right? Learning, mm -hmm. learning our lessons, and that's important. So, yes. so, so name a couple of people who've shaped you into the person you are today? I like the question. So, um, well, one, if we talk about this sense of, of, of uh, innovative thinking, solutions-oriented thinking, there was an entrepreneur in the Netherlands <clears throat> who unfortunately passed some years ago, but he was really a mentor for me in early on. He was a, re I mean, he was kind of a, he grew up as a hippie in the 60s and, and he, until his very last day, he died far too young. He looked like the very hippie he was uh, when he was in his 20s in the 60s. And, um, but he became a successful software entrepreneur, but he always was looking at situations from a new perspective. And he would always challenge the word, um, you know, what the words, the titles we were using. If you would say, you know, uh, uh, yeah, whatever it would be, an uh, annual report of a, of, a, of a company, he would say, yeah, but what does that actually mean, an annual report? So what are we trying to say here? Oh, it's a story about us, what we've done last year. So, okay, let's say that then. And, and, and maybe this may not be the perfect example, but the point is, for instance, in words, in what words we use, we determine very much on what we see and, and how we fra frame things. And by changing our words, we begin to see something new and we begin to understand, you know, um, if a, one thing is a beautiful thing in, 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 in the English language, one th something he told me uh, all those years ago, the word responsibility, which is, of course, a word we all know, is also, or it, it is in the root, our ability to respond. It's our response ability, right? Can we do this? Can we meet that challenge? But it sounds very different than, oh, I have a responsibility to be on time or whatever it is, right? Responsibility seems like a duty, seems, seems like a problem that we need to meet. But a responsibility, you know, we can rise to the occasion. And there you have a good example of what words can do in changing your perspective on, on, on the world around you. And what was his name? What was his name? Eckhart Vinson, and Eckhart is now a name you may know in our world, Eckhart Tolle, of course, he's a German well-known author, obviously, uh, but it's the same name. He had the same similar roots in Germany, although he was Dutch. Um, you know, he was uh, he was in a in a in a group 
I mean, he was Dutch, of course, but he was with Anita Roddick of the Body Shop, um, oh, yeah, ben, okay. and Jerry, ben, ben and Jerry's of the Ice Cream. These that was a group of. They're all basically hippies, but they were the early generation of the entrepreneurs doing the new things. So, yeah. There you go. Now, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, um, I always thought I was going to be a politician and if not a diplomat. Um, I always wanted, I think that's where that came from. I wanted to contribute, if not change the world. Um, and, and so I thought the way to do that would be politics. I actually never thought about journalism, but somebody, yeah, I guess who also had a big influence on my life at some point suggested to me, well, if you want to do that, why don't you become a journalist and, and start to learn a, th a few things about society before you actually take on a role of talking about it, get some experience. And well, that was a good idea, but I never left. Nice. So now we're going to do some sentence completions. So ah. com complete this sentence. I really love to go out on a hike and, you know, enjoy the nature around me and, and let it really, yeah, let my mind come to rest in the, in the, yeah, in the, in the inspiration of nature. Nice. My superpower is? Well, that I always am willing, I think it's more than anything else, willing to look for a solution. Mm. I mm, love that. I am proud of. I'm proud of that I uh, have been able to, to win the heart of Nancy. Oh, nice, nice. Life is. An inspiring lesson. It is a, a beautiful opportunity to learn who you are and what you come to do. Okay. One thing I would like to change about the world is. Well, now we're going to, you know, long. I would get rid of limited liability. Hmm. Interesting. Now you need to ask me why, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Go ahead and expound on that one a little bit. Yeah, of course, because that's quite a concept. So I see that. One of the biggest problems, the biggest causes of the challenges we face in our world is that we have the enormous powers of corporations. Corporations, you know, influence politics, they pollute the environment, they do so many things we don't want, but they are there. They are too powerful. And one of the, I think, the biggest reasons why corporations are too powerful is that they all enjoy limited liability. Now, so let me explain what that means. And, and you should stop me when this is too long a story, but the concept of limited liability is actually something that comes from, from uh, the Netherlands some three, 400 years ago when the Netherlands were, you know, the Dutch were sailing the, the, the oceans uh, with wooden ships and they were trying to basically, you know, uh, steal everything else, uh, you know, whether it was coffee or whatever it was, wherever in the world and bring it home and, and make money that way. The problem they had was that there would be the risk of, um, you know, a ship could go out for months, sail to Asia, never come back because of it, you know, it got into a storm and it got destroyed. So somebody investing in that ship would lose his or her money. The problem would be that, you know, if I would be the son or daughter of that very person, I would then carry on that debt because I, you know, didn't get my money back. So. They invented the concept of limited liability to say, OK, well, your investment is what it is. And if you lose it, that's it. That's the end of it. And there is no carry forward in generations and all that, which makes sense in terms of natural disasters. I'm not saying that anything the Dutch did as colonialists is right, by the way. But, but from a business perspective, that was a uh, sensible concept. Fast forward to the world we live in. You can build a chemical plant next to a poor neighborhood and nobody is responsible actually when something goes wrong. So people do things that they would never do in their own garden when they run a corporation. And they can do that because of that concept, that legal concept of limited liability. If that would not be there, that CEO would think 
10 times more, okay, shall I indeed build that power plant close to a whatever, an earth fold, you know, uh, fold in, 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 in California, that may not be the best idea. That may be the cheapest place to do it, but not so safe, right? So you start thinking, what is the impact that I really have on people and planet? And that goes to the root of what I want to, the problem I want to solve. If we make things smaller, if we really, if you know, if you and I need to deal with each other in doing something, we, we take care of each other. We are used to do that as people. Corporations don't play that game. And the only way to get rid of that is to get that legal concept out, which was never designed for natural, you know, for, for people basically misbehaving and, 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 and you know, doing bad things. Anyway. Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> that, that's, that makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. So now I'd like you to introduce yourself professionally and tell the audience about CAMP Solutions. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Michael. So what I learned when I uh, was educated in the newsroom of a mainstream paper back then in the Netherlands, I learned that media focus on what goes wrong in society. I'm not saying that's not important. It is important. We've seen a lot of that in the past years in the, in the United States, where media really had to fulfill that role that is described as the fourth pillar of democracy. Very important. However, what I want to do and what my mission is, is to address the very solutions that we need to solve those problems. So what I want is that media focus more on, not just on whatever the problem is, they analyze it, they need to do it, they need to make us, bring, make us aware of what is wrong, but we also need to look at what goes right and what we can do to solve problems. And that is the focus of Camp Solutions. I go through the world and over all those years, I build a network of people, entrepreneurs, scientists, authors, people who look for the answers to the problems. Wow. Which leads me to how I actually ran into your work, which was Old Magazine. So I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly how I found it, but I know it was online. And I remember the title said something to the effect of, are you ready for positive news, right? And it, it intrigued me. I said, wow, a magazine that focuses on positivity. Now, my friends gave me a nickname and they call me Michael Happy Ass Taylor because, because they say I'm always happy, I'm always optimistic. Well, to find a magazine that had really amazing content, informative, intellectually stimulating content, but that wasn't negative. I mean, as soon as I saw that, I ordered, I, I, I got a subscription because I wanted to get that. And I loved getting that magazine, really enjoyed it. So with that being said, you launch this idea called Old Magazine. So tell us about how that came to be and what was the reaction when you first launched? Well, you know, the, 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 the reason why I did is it, was actually to, 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 as I said before, to work on those problems and say, okay, well, I understand that that is not right. We are polluting with that business. So how can we turn that business into a business that doesn't pollute the environment? I mean, as simple as that. What other solution do we have for plastic? Can we use different plastic or not use plastic? I mean, these kind of simple things. Uh, and obviously also in health. Are we dependent on the pharmaceutical industry that needs to make a lot of money on drugs that we need to take? Is that good that I turn on the television, I'm being sold all these ads that half of the commercial is about whatever the negative side effects are? I mean, why do we even sell these things? Are there better ways? Of course there are. There are complementary systems that are often as successful in treating things as, as these drugs are, but of course they are not marketed with the same kind of marketing power, which goes back to my limited liability thing. But ultimately, these kind of solutions I was looking for. So what did people say? Well, people say, well, is that necessary? Do we need a, a magazine focused on positive news? Is that real? It's the same thing like, you know, you're an optimist, that is, you're not a realist. I'm always saying, well, Yes, I use the word uh, positive news, but, but what I want to make very clear is that positive news is not necessarily just that good news like, hey, it's a beautiful day, the sun is shining. 
I've been talking about problems now in this conversation several times. What really my work is about is that there is a problem. There is, a, there is something wrong. And I want to contribute to the solution. So it starts, if you like, with bad news. That is the problem. The pollution, the, the, you know, the plastic in the oceans. That is not a good story. But that is where I start. And then I'm going to say, OK, what are we going to do to get that plastic out of the ocean? So it is not just good news, you know, uh, as they say that, uh, you know, uh, teary eyes and all that. No, right. it is hard work, but it is inspiring work because I truly believe that humans like one thing the best, that is solving problems. We love it when we can make a meaningful contribution to our neighbors' lives. Every, we, we feel good about that. Everyone does that. And so uh, it's the same thing in, as an entrepreneur. When you really do something that makes the world better, it motivates you, it inspires you. Yeah. Now, you had a quote on your site that I love, and you say, there are just not enough problems for the solutions we have. Yeah. Okay. Can, you, can you expound on that? Well, here's the thing. I, I love that quote too, and, I, and that would be self-serving because it's my quote, but here it is. Sometimes as a writer, and I'm sure you have that experience, you're sitting at, at, your, at your computer and you have your keyboard and you look at the screen and say, well, that is a great line. And I really had that. When I typed that line, it was for a little book on optimism that I wrote. You know, I felt the line is not coming from me. I, I guess I channeled it from wherever it came from. But so I, I, I can talk about it with the enthusiasm, but it's not my line where, you know, in, in the world we're living in, it's, I guess, my line. But, but the point being, it is a moment of inspiration. And what it says to me is that, you know, I always see at least the beginning of the solution. I mean, that very thing that people talk about, plastic in the ocean, I keep coming back to that. But to lots of people, when we know that every minute, a truckload of plastic is going into the ocean every minute. So how do we ever get it out? Well, that seems like absolutely insurmountable. So much, and what can you do, right? But I know, and I'm not going to talk about all that now, but, but there are solutions, and they will solve the problem. So does that mean that the problem doesn't exist? No, the problem is there. It may take 100 years for us to solve this, but we can do it. We have the tools, and, and that's what that quote means to me. There is a solution. And that's beautiful. And, and I agree again wholeheartedly. Now, I'm curious, though, have you always been this optimistic? Well, you know, in the little book on optimism, I wrote myself and I explained my personal story a little bit. I, I think, let me compare it with people who teach meditation. My perspective is there are people who never need to meditate because they're just born meditators if you like they they live their life as one big meditation they don't need to do anything to to improve on that there are also people who need to talk a lot about how important meditation is these are not the people i think who are natural meditators they are not naturally having that balance they need to learn a lot themselves and what they're basically doing is you know is this they're, they're telling about their own journey of discovery of how important that is so I'm not going to talk about you because it would apply to you too, I guess, but uh, because I think it applies to everyone. But let me talk about myself. So why do I talk about optimism? Probably not. And I will say no, because of course I know myself at least now a little better than when I was born. I'm not a naturally born optimist. I probably carry in me the seeds of, of yeah, doubt and negative feelings. And uh, I, I'm very familiar with, not seeing the opportunity. So I am learning optimism. I have learned optimism throughout my life. Yes, I, I would consider myself an optimist now, and maybe we can talk about what optimism actually means, but but I, I would say that now, but I'm, I, I was not like that 30 years ago. And so, or 40 years ago, whatever it was. So I, I think that I embrace this journey because it's my journey. And, and therefore, I'm also somebody who can speak about it because I, I know what it is. I mean, you can't learn anything from someone who has never been through something. Somebody who has a challenge seeing the bright side of life uh, can, has, can possibly learn more from me because I know uh, also what it could look like when there's no bright side of life. It's hard to learn that from someone who's actually never seeing anything like that. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, 
why I'm so optimistic because I had to overcome being a high school dropout, divorce, yeah. bankruptcy, foreclosure, yeah. depression. I was actually homeless for two years living out of a car. So I know what it's like to deal with yeah, adversity, yeah. but there was something in me. And, and I, I attribute a lot of it to my mom because I think my mom passed down what I'll call a resiliency gene. Yes. Uh, because my mom, she overcame some amazing obstacles being a single mom with six kids back in the 60s, you know. So so it's like she she passed on that resiliency gene. But I also believe as human beings, each of us has a design, divine purpose. I, I believe from a spiritual perspective, we are put on this planet to do something amazing. And yeah. it's our responsibility to figure out what that is. And so the reason that I'm so extremely optimistic about the future is because I was able to see shall yeah. I say, the worst of life, right? Yeah. And so now my life is pretty close to perfect from the standpoint of I have the love of my life, been happily married for 19 years. I got a roof over my head. I do what I absolutely love. So there's this sense in me that says, how can I share that with other people? Because in sharing that, hopefully we can get other people to have that same experience. And that's how I think we change the world. Exactly. Now, with, with that being said, I'm curious, though, as a, as a magazine, how difficult was it or is it difficult to find journalists who want to write from that positive perspective? Well, you have a good question. I first want to say, Michael, I, thank you for sharing your story also, because I, and I, I deeply appreciate that. And I can see w these were serious obstacles you had to overcome. So uh, I applaud your uh, resilience indeed for uh, overcoming all that. You know, yes, journalists, generally speaking, are not optimists. Let me put it like that. Um, journalists are, tend to be, uh, uh, you know, suspicious they think that people are doing things that they're not saying and, and you know, and, and very often there are good reasons for that. I mean, you need to ask deeper questions to really find out what's going on. And, you know, just one, I mean, just take what kind of a person do you need to be to, for instance, report on what's going on in Washington DC these days and politics, right? Do, can you trust any, you know, politician over there uh, that they really mean what they're saying? They're probably not. So what kind of a mindset does that journalist have to have? I mean, they have to be, yeah, suspicious, negative, if you like, but it, probably not true, that kind of thinking, which is obviously not what you and I like. We like to say, well, of course, let's do it, right? And, and if somebody says, I'm going to make the whole of the United States uh, green, clean energy, of course, let's all do it, right? But, but obviously, that, that you can't do that in Washington. So to your point, it is not so easy to find like-minded souls in journalism. Um, but of course, they are there. And you know, nowadays, there is even a word or a term, if you like, solutions journalism, which didn't even exist when I started on my journey. Uh, doing basically that. So the fact that that word is there means that more people talk about it and, and, and more people probably will practice it. So, and I've met many more people who now say, well, this is important, at least part of my work, I'm doing that. And so, you know, it, it, it's expanding. Good, good. Now, the title of my book, Don't Believe the Hype of the Negative Media, apparently offended a lot of journalists. As a matter of fact, I created a different title and published a different version called The Good News Is The Future Is Brighter Than You Think. Uh -huh. It's doing much better when approaching journalists. So from a journalist perspective, why do you think they were offended by that title? Well, because this is the same thing about optimism, uh, where people say, well, but that's not realistic. So journalists think that they're bias to negativity is just is reality this is the world that they see but that's exactly the way i just said it that's the world that they see it's not the reality i mean if you and i go through our days and we would ask everyone you know how are you and and, and really have a conversation about it for a few minutes we would find out that most people we meet throughout the day for most people, it will be that they have a day that are more is going right and wrong. That is the average example. I mean, you, if you just go through a day, and you meet 10 people who've all love, lost their loved one that very day, that's highly unlikely, right? So that is just not reality. Most people 
have reasonable days. Now, if you would turn, if, if a media, if, if, if a newspaper then is to cover whatever is in society, then obviously in the front page, you know, more than half of the front page should be, if it's a reflection of what's happening, it should be about things going right. Or I mean, I would say 80% because that is the reality. Right. But that is not the reality because they focus on the other side, right? So, but they think that that is what they see. Yes, it's what they see, it's what they want to see. And I, granted, there's not a big reason to write a story, uh, you know, why the train in Santa Barbara on the way to, to LA uh, arrived on time today. Although <laughs> there are stories there, but, but you know, but, but you see the point, right? Yeah. Journalists are trying to, to solve, uh, to, to investigate what it is that didn't go according to plan. That's, that's, that's their mission. And, and it's an important mission. Again, that is why it's the fourth pillar of democracy in a well-functioning society. But it drives you towards the negative, towards the problem. And, and I think there needs to be an awareness about that. I'm not against that at all. I think investigative journalism is very important. You know, we want to know what happened you know, on January 6th in the United States you know who did that we want to know that we need to investigate so i applaud all that but at the same time i want to know how we are going to build businesses that don't pollute or and and why can i have a big story on that on the front page as well yeah yeah see i love how you focus on creating solutions to the challenges facing our world and i know you're passionate about finding solutions to things like global warming and climate change and so forth but I'm wondering, have you thought about finding solutions to the racial tensions our country and the world is currently, currently experiencing? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, uh, thought about yes, and, and there we have it. Um, you know, it's one of, uh, that I, I mentioned interracial marriages. I mean, I think it's about 10% now, uh, whatever it was 20 years ago, but like 6%. So this is positive, but is it the ultimate solution yet? No. But it is, it is one of those things that, that show where we need to go. Well, I think the challenge for our society is, 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 is and that includes the racial tension, um, is that we have lost the logical, I mean, the, the things that, the structures that were in place, place you know, decades ago, where we would come together. And obviously one of them would be the church. A very important one and that church doesn't function for most people anymore as it did you know 30 40 and, and years longer ago now then people sometimes say for instance for friend this is more directly for for uh, interracial also you know military service had something good because it, it forced people to come together people who didn't know each other to work together and to start appreciating, you know, each other in, in difficult circumstances. And, you know, obviously, I, I guess you and I need, don't need to talk about the fact that we don't need armies. And we, I mean, all of that, that I don't support at all. But the point of having bring people work together on something, people coming from all walks of life, that helps at least. Experiences like that help. None of that works anymore because there's no drafts anymore. So you, you know, you can only go into the army when you want. It's not a, it's no longer that 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 structure that brings some of that connection. So, you know, I've been thinking, and I know that people sometimes talk about that. How good would it be for the world if, you know, high school kids or college kids, if they had to serve their country uh, or the world for that matter? Uh, for one year, you know, when they're in those early years, uh, whatever, after high school, before college, after college, whatever that is, you are supposed to do to work with people on something that serves, you yeah, know, the, the common good. And it would bring people, people together again. And it would be crazy, of course, because that would be paid for by the government and all these things that people never want. But it would also be a, a, a structure that would help people to, to see the other. Because now we live in these all these silos where people don't know what's going on. I mean, you know, how hard it is to live on the other side of the street. And, and, you know, and, and then of course, with that reinforcement of social media, 
where we also you know only listen to the people we are already listening to so yeah but i'm not saying this is a perfect solution but it's one of these things we can do because it, it is a major concern i mean yeah and you know interestingly enough as a as a man who happens to be black it's interesting that my optimism yeah in the black community is sometimes seen as a denial of the challenges that black people face. I understand that, yes. Um, but see, I, again, I, from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm 60 years old and I remember the 60s. I, I remember the segregation and all of that. And as I look at the trajectory that this country is on from just when I was the kid to where we are now, for me, it gives me reason for optimism. I don't deny the racial tension, but from a larger global perspective, it is my belief that the direction we're moving in is the right direction yeah. in, in terms of race relations. For example, uh, with uh, President Trump, to me, it was like we needed that to bring awareness mm -hmm. to the fact that there are still racial issues that we have not dealt with in this country. And having that person in that position has shined a light on race religion uh, relations in a way that I don't think any other anyone else has done. So for me, as painful as it might have been, I still see it as a positive wow. uh, because I see, for example, the conversation amongst whites having a conversation about white fragility and you hear people talking about white privilege and and i think the the whole george floyd thing sort of opened the awareness that we've got some racial issues that we still haven't dealt with and so deeper in our society i believe that has caused the shift for the positive that we're engaging in these conversations for example if you look at the conversation about corporations that are having diversity and inclusion conversations and, and, and having these dialogues about race, as uncomfortable as it might be, I still believe we're moving in the right direction. That's just, just my interpretation of it. Well, so, I, go ahead. Well, I, will, I will agree with you and will also say that I so much understand the people who feel that pain. I mean, it's Absolutely. just ridiculous how long, and, I'm, I, and of course you do that too, even better than I do, but, but the point being, you know, these things side by side, I, I, yes, acknowledge the pain, but also see that there is progress. I mean, it is frustrating how slow that progress is. I, I find the very thing, these examples, the George Floyd situation, it's just terrible. I mean, that, that but of course, yeah, it, it is better than 50 years ago. Yes, that's, that is true. And, but with awareness, and, and I will agree that, that this whole Trump uh, era, hopefully we don't have to go through that again, but yeah. it, it, it did bring that awareness. You know, we need to do more and, and, and we are doing more and that is good. And yeah, uh, you know, the, the, it, it, but it is also shocking. I have to say that I meet people. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I will say that I meet white people who, who sort of totally, say to me well but this is you know that was a problem 50 years ago we have settled that i said now if you yeah, ask see, any black person there's nothing settled i mean there's a lot to be enormous i mean this is not equal you know if you if you come into the world or your children they have a much bigger challenge uh, to overcome still than my children it's just a fact and that's not right yeah and, and here's what i believe see because i believe collectively a lot of white people sort of went to sleep on race relations when we elected President Obama. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we got a black president. Racism yeah. is over. You know, racism yeah. is over. Problem solved. Yes. <laughs> Problem solved. But again, I think what Trump has done is said, whoa, wait a minute. There's yeah. still some issues we need to address. And again, yeah. that's that's the the lesson, I guess, in this whole thing. And so yeah. again, the optimist in me sees it as a positive thing that it has awakened us collectively as a country to start working and dealing with this racial issue and moving past it. And I personally believe eventually we will. That's just, just my perception. Well, I mean, that, again, I mean, five years from now, there will be more interracial marriages than there were five years ago. So that is just, that continues to grow. And yep. that is the 
the, the one simple statistic that tells you that we're, we're going in the right direction. Absolutely. Now, you wrote a blog and you said, we can reverse global warming and we're doing it. Yeah. Now, obviously that's a big issue. Um, that's definitely close to my heart and I think everybody should be concerned about it. So talk a little bit about that and what data do you have that supports that we're actually doing that? Okay, so the data come from this project that I uh, quote in that uh, story called Drawdown, which was done by the author Paul Hawken, author and entrepreneur out of the Bay Area, San Francisco. San Francisco. And um, they did this project, they, they looked at all the technologies that are in place today. So there's nothing about, you know, and they were simply saying, okay, today there are solar panels. Today we have agriculture as it is. We have so many windmills. So, and what has been the growth pattern in these areas over the past 10 years? And what would be a reasonable assumption for the next 10 years based on what we now know? And when they modeled all these things, they came to this moment of drawdown in 2045, say 20, 25 years from now, and drawdown being the moment that we actually start taking CO2 out of the sky. So we're going to bring CO2 levels down. So, and that was based, that's the important inspiration of that work. It's based on modeling of existing technologies. It's not based on, um, uh, you know, on anything that's being invented today and that they didn't know about when they were doing the project. Um, it's also based on what they knew in 2017 when they did it about what that is for electric cars. I'm perfectly sure that, uh, you know, the electric car revolution is going faster than, than they modeled at the time. So that will even bring the goal closer. So the point is that, that and that's what I wanted to make, people feel so, uh, you know, powerless, disempowered uh, in the situation where uh, you know politicians don't make the decisions that are good for the planet and future generations but the point is that business is is working on all these problems doing the thing that business does best and that is finding ways to make money and that is happening as we speak not because of government subsidies but simply because of new technologies finding the markets and and so yeah that is a, a trend that happens beneath all the statistics. I mean, it is still true that that you know CO two levels are rising because it takes a while for that to to change, right? But the trajectories are towards that moment of twenty forty five. And if you see what's going on now, it's probably poss quite possible that we will get there sooner. So that's that's what I wanted to say about it. We are reversing global warming. You know, it's just happening. It, it doesn't take into account. Let me tell you my favorite story. Can I do that? Sure. This one. See this? Okay. Well, it's hard to see, of course, over these uh, online cameras, but this is a piece of cardboard. This piece of cardboard is made without trees and without water. What I'm holding in my hands is light, but it's 80% stone, waste, crown stone, and the other 20% is plastic. You don't like plastic, I'll tell you more about the plastic label. The point is, we can make every box that we all now use, right? 50% of the world paper market is cardboard boxes. You can understand that because we all order from Amazon and we have the FedEx deliveries and God knows what. So that is happening, it's a big thing. Granted, today, cardboard boxes are not made from virgin forests, uh, you know, not from the Amazon, Amazon rainforest. That comes from tree farms. And the boxes are recycled as much as we can, but recycling has a limited um, ex uh, possibility because you can recycle paper or cardboard five, six, seven, maybe ten times, and then the fibers get too short. You have to have you need new paper, new pulp, and then you go back to the tree farm. Now, if we start using waste from mines to make all our boxes, first of all, we can make our boxes fifty percent cheaper than they are today because the waste of mines is, of course, very cheap. You don't need to grow trees. 
you can also uh, recycle those boxes forever. It's mineral based. There's no sort of fibers and, and organic matter that shrinks or whatever. No, this is the same molecules for uh, the, the rest of the duration of the planet. So you can recycle forever. It because of the plastic layer, it it is uh, water resistant, which is very helpful for boxes too. They're, they're more durable. And so you can, you use plastic, but actually this would be a good way to use plastic because you can use it forever without pollution, causing pollution. Apart from the fact that you can also make it, it's not, it's a very new innovation. So they're do, not doing it yet, but you can make the plastic also biodegradable. So then that problem is also solved that way. I'm telling you this because this is another example. All those tree farms that are now producing trees for uh, cardboard boxes, that's 50% of the world paper market, these tree farms could be turned into real forests because we don't need that cardboard. We can, we can use it, as I just said, from stone paper. Now, what happens then is that suddenly these huge you know, areas of land where now trees are growing, being harvested, growing hard, they can become real forests, real forests that have healthy soils and they, that are not monoculture tree farms that attract new wildlife, that attract all kinds of species that will capture more carbon. So this is a major contribution to, uh, for instance, the problem of climate change on many levels. But you know that's not in the project drawdown that I just talked about. So this is an innovation that's not even in there, but it is going to happen. I'm going to make sure that we'll see a first stone paper plant in the United States soon. Nice. Now, follow that up. You also wrote an article <clears throat> about the Green New Deal yeah. and how it's already happening. So give me the cliff note version of how you see the Green New Deal. Well, the Green New Deal, from what I understand from you know, the political perspective, is where government can put it's, it's money and it's systems and it's, it's laws in such a way that you actually promote new you know, technology, new inno innovation that, that makes the, the world sustainable. And, and that is, of course, a good thing for governments to do. And they call it uh, the Green New Deal because in a similar way, what Roosevelt did, what was the New Deal, was doing a, a similar thing for society on a social level. So basically what we're doing is we do a big, outreach led by government to do uh, for the planet, for our natural environment, what we have done before for our social environment. It makes sense. It's a good thing for governments to do. And I'm all for that. I only want to say again about that, but the Green New Deal, given that so many of these things already are being taken care of by business, you know, people don't need to feel uh, you know, anxious about the future. They, uh, it will be better. And you, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the headlines of your book. I mean, the future is better than we think. There are many things happening that you don't hear about, don't read about, but it is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when I look at, again, I'm a, I'm a big tech geek. I, I love technology and, and, and see what's happening. And, and in my book, I, wrote, I write about some of the technologies that uh, I'm pretty excited about and how they're gonna improve uh, the world in general in the future. And of course, we know about solar, uh, the impact that it's having now, how solar now is you know, a cheaper source of energy than coal and some of the other things. So obviously that's going to contribute to uh, slowing down the global warming and helpfully reversing it. So are there any technologies, new technologies out there that you see that you're pretty excited about? Well, I mean, I know I, that's the problem. I know too many, but um, since you talk about solar, I'll give you one. So here's a good one. So the, do you remember, uh, you, you and I are the same age, so old enough to know that you have a typewriter with a carbon paper so that you can make a copy, right? Remember that? You've, oh, yeah. you've done that, okay. Oh, so, yeah. so the company that invented that, it was a French company, they know something. They know how to spread ink thinly on a layer of yeah, paper or whatever, that is their technology. Now, is that a useful technology today? No, not much because we don't use it anymore. So what did they do? They were thinking, I mean, they, of course, they went into magnetic tapes and all that for data storage and all similar kind of technology, but then whatever, five, 10 years ago, 
they were sitting in their French uh, headquarters and they were thinking, okay, what can we do with our technology that you know uses the same kind of know-how that we have mastered, but that makes sense in, in today's world. So what they came up with is a solar cell that can create, turns light into electricity that you can print on a thin layer, same thin layer again, like the carbon paper, in this case, a film, a, a see-through film. And now you have like a plastic film that you can paste on these, these uh, you know, um, uh, skyscrapers in, in Manhattan and all these windows that reflect the sun now become uh, solar energy production uh, wow. units. Now that's, a, uh, and of course, so the, the so-called conversion from light into electricity is not as high as it would be on a real solar panel, mm -hmm. but that's not relevant. The relevancy here, the relevance here is that you can use it you know, so cheaply on a, on a window that just remains the same window. You see through, nothing changes, and you use that surface, and there's all additional power. Here's a, it's a beautiful example. Is that in the project drawdown or talked about? No, nobody even knows about that technology. Is this going to happen? Of course, these people have been selling carbon paper for 100 years. Do they know how to sell this? Of course they do that. And so, and is somebody who owns an, a skyscraper in Manhattan who is being told you can buy this for X and you save Y on your electricity cost, is he going to say, okay, well, I do the matter. Yeah, put it on, fine. So is this going to happen? Of course it's going to happen. So for me, this is, this is how I see it. My belief is that entrepreneurs are the key to changing the world. Because when entrepreneurs come up with technologies and innovation and stuff like that, that's what, not the government, it's people with vision, it's people with passion, people with ideas that say, you know what? I got a way to make the world a better place. Now, there's a, there's a term that's been floating around uh, for a while called social entrepreneurs. I'm sure you've heard that term, social mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Uh, social entrepreneurs and what some people call heart-centered businesses, meaning people are starting business not with the whole intention of making a profit, but making a difference. Yeah. And so you have a program called the Portraits of Pioneers of Possibilities, where you interview uh, some people, some entrepreneurs, and people that um, a couple of guys that I really like. For example, you interviewed uh, one of my favorite guys is Richard Branson. And uh, Deepak Chopra is a, a teacher that I've been following for years who's really been my spiritual teacher for a very long time. So tell us a little bit about that program. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically an extension of, of, of this solutions focus that I'm working on. And, 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 and so I wanna, well, I so agree with what you just said. I mean, we need, there are people who lead this effort. These are mostly the business people, not always, because you mentioned Chopra, who leads us in a way of, indeed, as you started off, you know, our conversation uh, to the listeners saying, you know, it is the mindset that ultimately, you know, determines the outcome. And, and on that level, uh, people uh, like Chopra have, have a major contribution to bring. It is a fact that some of those entrepreneurs, uh, you know, that's what they have. They have that talent to focus their mindset on, on solving a problem or making a major contribution. And that's inspiring. But I do agree that ultimately the people who accept the fact that we control our own control in, 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 a, in, a, in a limited way, obviously, we don't, you know, there's death, there's an end, for instance. We don't, can't just keep on living. But we do control our thoughts and we can determine through our thinking what it is that we can contribute, what we can do. So you also said, you know, each human being, and I so agree with that too, um, has a unique contribution to make. And, and, you know, we may admire certain entrepreneurs because they make very big contributions and somebody like Branson has done that. There are people who make very small contributions, but that are, that are extremely meaningful to a small community. So it doesn't really matter. Some people make a contribution that only serves the very woman or, or man they're loving. So it's not about size and scale. It is about doing 
that thing that truly you can and want to contribute. And, and, and that's the essence. And if I always say, if all of us would be doing that, this world would be such a different place. You know, that is just the, the best. It, there's no, nothing more fulfilling for anyone to do than to make that contribution that is exactly yours. Yeah. Now, with that thought in mind, uh, mentioning Deepak Chopra, do you have a meditation practice that you follow? Well, I, I for years, they tried to sell me uh, because I did the research <laughs> and I was talking about it. People said, you know, transcendental meditation, um, you know, is the, is, the, is the best kind of meditation. And I had learned to meditate when I was a correspondent in India many years ago. And so I had a practice that I did. And then for a story, which is, by the way, one of the most interesting stories I ever did, where it was proven that big groups of meditators can influence levels of violence in society. So that literally is this fascinating research that was done by the TM, Transcendental Meditation movie, Movement. And so when I was working on that, I once again met all many people in, in, you know, in, the, in the circles of TM. And they said, well, the, the our meditation is superior. I said, okay, well, I've heard this so many times. Teach me that. So they did. And I must say that I like that practice a lot. Um, it works very well for me. So I'm not saying it's a superior, but it is a good practice. It is simple. And maybe that simplicity works very well for me. Mm -hmm. um, I always felt there was a need to see all kinds of visions that I never had. Um, but the, the TM practice yeah, helps me. And that's what I yeah, regularly uh, do. Yeah. yeah, so I know probably the greatest gift I gave myself some 25 years ago was, was learning how to meditate. And who, who taught you that? I'm sorry? Who taught you that? Several people. Uh, there's a guy that I, I follow a lot named Craig Hamilton. Um, he has a unique approach to meditation in that meditation isn't the process of trying to make your mind go blank. He said, meditation is simply creating a relationship with your mind. He said, so being in touch with your mind and, and, and that's what it's about. It's not about just trying to go blank and not thinking. It's about the relationship you have with thought. Yeah. And uh, for me, for example, meditation is, is such an integral part of my life. I mean, I can be on stage talking to 500 people and be meditating. So it's, it's, it's different from most people, how most people perceive meditation. Yeah, uh, people think it's just sitting in a room being quiet, but it's it's a little deeper than that. And Craig Craig Hamilton is, is a really good teacher for me. Uh, but like yeah. I said, Deep, yeah. Deepak Chopra, I followed for years. Uh, I've had an opportunity to go to a couple of his workshops, meditation workshops, and it's been yeah. really instrumental. And I, I attribute my net, my meditation practice to my creativity because uh, I'm I'm absolutely certain that that I'm sure. that yeah. ability to quiet my mind and listen and receive. Um, Creativity, I think, comes from that higher source, whatever you choose to call it, that higher source. Yeah. So as we wind down, I'd like to know what's next for Durian Camp? What's what's on the horizon? What are you working on? What's exciting coming up? Well, the one thing I'm working on, and that brings me to your listeners also, uh, I'm trying to build this magazine. Here's a copy printed on that very stone paper we talked about. Um, People can go to the camp.solutions website where you can uh, download a, a free issue. You can see it digitally, and then obviously you can get the print stone paper version too. Again, a magazine without trees and water. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And, you know, at the same time, I'm working on those solutions a little bit more than in the past, not just as a writer. Uh, I mentioned I'm seriously uh, exploring the opportunity to to start stone paper production in, you know, in, in other places. It's a Chinese innovation. So far, there are, there are no plans outside China. Uh, I think that has to happen. And, and I could try to help with that. There are a few other solutions that I, you know, I'm very familiar with and that I want to uh, bring to the world um, in a more active role. Um, so that's probably a new phase of my life. Uh, I, I'm, I've, I'm sort of moving a little bit beyond the storyteller only. I want to. I want to see it happen. I want to see and and you know sometimes bringing a few people together is just what it takes, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, give the people your web address, how they can find out about your magazine and your work. What's the web address? It's camp.solutions. 
And so it ends with solutions, no.com, camp, K-A-M-P dot solutions. And on that very website, there are various opportunities to, uh, to get a free issue of the magazine. So to get familiar with what we're doing. All right. So now I want to give you an opportunity to close out the interview with your final words of wisdom, your words of optimism to the audience. So what message do you want to leave with the audience? Well, we didn't talk about that yet. So let me indeed talk about optimism a little bit. Okay. There again, optimism, it is not to see only the bright side. It's not this, um, what's her name again? Um, the the rose-colored glasses of uh, Pollyanna. Uh, that is not true optimism. Um, as I said about news, uh, you know, the news that I'm doing, the solutions news, is solutions news and can only be solutions news because it starts with a problem. The same thing with optimism. Optimism is to find the attitude to deal with the situation that is at hand. Quite often, that is a challenge. And so optimism is not sort of looking through these rose colored glasses and seeing something that is not there. Optimism is taking the real moment of now and saying, okay, what can I do with this? What are the building blocks that I have now that I can work with to create something that is better or a step forward and, and leads me to, to the next stage. That is optimism. Because at that moment, realism doesn't help you because realism then means, okay, well, this is, this is it. No, this is not it. This is the beginning of something else. And that is what makes life more interesting, more inspiring and more fulfilling. So that, that is critical. And so I, I very much fight People will say, well, I don't want to be an optimist because I'm a realist. No, realist stand still. That is the status quo. You need optimism to take what you have to make something better. And that is not because it's not good enough. No, it's because it's always fun to create the new thing. Mm, perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for spreading optimism. Thank you for sharing information that inspires, that, that challenges us to look for solutions because that, once again, is the key. So it's not just about this airy, fairy, new age, you know, everything's perfect kind of thing. It's like, how can we change the world for the better? And that's, that's what I'm committed to, doing my part in trying to make that happen. So again, thank you for the contribution that you've made in my life. I really appreciate it. Now, Michael, it's, it means a lot to me that you reached uh, reach out to me and I look forward to staying in touch and uh, supporting each other. And for that matter, make sure you share our uh, interview with me so that I can share it with, the, uh, with my audience. And uh, yeah, let's uh, work together. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's what it's about. It's all about collaboration, working together, coming together to make the world a better place. Now, I hope this, this interview has given you some reasons for optimism. Now, if you want to go a little deeper and find reasons for optimism in your own life, be sure to pick up a copy of my book, Don't Believe the Hype of the Negative Media. It's available through most online bookstores. And if you'd like to receive a personally autographed copy, just log on to my website, creationpublishing.com, and I'll make sure that I personally sign it for you. So this concludes the episode of Don't Believe the Hype. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the Don't Believe the Hype podcast. So don't believe the hype because the future is brighter than you think. We'll see you next episode. H Y P E. Don't believe it. Coach Michael Taylor. Irrepressible optimist with a passion for the impossible. Empowering people to transform their lives from the inside out.